So with me today is Pearl Lam, known as the force for contemporary design in China and probably all over Asia by this point. So welcome to Conversation 360 podcast mm -hmm. and this Asia and the West series, Pearl. Thank you. So Pearl, my first question is when we talk about conversations taking place between Asia and the West, what does that mean to you? What, what does that bring to mind? We know, you know, Asia is so big that it's really hard when you say Asia. For us, I mean, of course, the first priority you look at is China. It used to be Japan, right? Mm -hmm. Nowadays, it's China. And then after that, you look at Southeast Asia. And of course, Japan is by itself. So when you talk to me, Asia, I will ask you. So like what part of it? I mean, which part of it? Are you talking about China? Are you talking about Southeast Asia? Are you talking about, about um, Japan? And, and it's too big to True. give you the well, even China, true. I too mean, big. China, even in North and South China, is, or West and East, is really, is really different. In a way, it's an even bigger example of what happens when people say, what about America? And you say, well, you're talking about Nevada. Yes, exactly. Or are you exactly. talking about, or are you talking about the, the Middle America? Right. Well, yes, which has become even more important to us yes. lately. So, so let's assume, though, that we're talking primarily about China. When I ask that question about conversations that are taking place, especially between China and the West. What is that? I mean, for me, is when I look at China, when I look at how the Western perception about China or how China understands the West, I think it was totally miscommunication and totally mm -hmm. misunderstanding between each other. i give you one example. I remember 2008 during the Olympics time. Uh, when I arrived in Beijing, I, you know, I, when I arrived in, in Beijing, first thing I saw just before Olympics, it was very clean, but I thought it was a total destruction of Beijing because there's no more old Beijing. I mean, um, what is, what is beautiful about Beijing has completely disappeared. It becomes a, a sci-fi city. Then next thing you read from the China Daily. The China Daily said, you know, now we are so proud. Mm. China is showing the world about, you know, modern building, about the modernity, that we are, we are the powerful nations. We are, we are like the West. We have this modern, modern, you know, uh, modern China. But I think most of the people comes to China, goes to Beijing. They actually appreciate the old Chinese culture, the historical, because China, after all these years, years, thousands of years, is still China. It's never been conquered or completely, you know, your whole culture gone. It's still the old China, which was the most, you know, with the main attraction for any foreign tourists. It was completely lost in China. They could not, and up, I don't think up to now, they understood what the West is looking into China. So Chinese is completely have a mis misinterpretations about the West. And many of the things, um, I mean, until now, when you read, is a complete misunder m misunderstanding. Same thing about when you read about the Western press about China. I think it's, it's lost in translation in many ways. Well, I think you're right. I remember going to Shanghai the first time and seeing the French concession and just being so taken by by what it looked like. And then the next time I was there, parts of it were gone. You know, it was just... I mean, nothing. Shanghai is already most protected compared to and to, hear, and yeah. to Beijing. Beijing is a complete destruction because three, three, uh, three roads, uh, three rows of housing, they knock down the center and becomes two rows. And in order to create, uh, I mean, a road with 16 lanes. That huge avenue. I mean, that, yeah. I mean, that 16 lanes only happen in, in, in Midwest. <laughs> I mean, why? So, I, I, you know, there are a lot of, a lot of things that what China, perce I mean, the perception of the West and what they perceive the West expectation about modernity, about how great a country is, is completely lost. So you seem to really epitomize a fusion of Asia 
specifically China in the West? I mean, I'm very lucky in an, in a way is because I was sent away and study at a very early age. That's when you in went the to the UK. West, yeah, I left when I was, but it was very usual for Hong Kong family to send kids away, especially if they go to UK at a very early age. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I, you know, so I understand. I was a, I was grew up under a British colony. <laughs> So obviously, I have this really colonial attitude, especially when I study abroad. And the first, actually, the first time I went to China was in 1992. And, and I remember that I saw somewhere it said when you went to Shanghai, that's where you learned to be Chinese. Yes, I explain I, that. I actually, bit. you know, a first trip ever I went to China was 1992 because my mother wanted to go back to Shanghai to to find where she grew up and buy the house. Um, the she background. Was a huge real I mean, she's a she, no, she's a Chinese. She's a, she's basically at the time she was a housewife. She's never done business in her life. She was just going back to buy her own house. Okay. And um, because I grew up in a family where my mother is very Chinese, so all her friends are all Chinese. They speak Chinese to each other. They feel comfortable with this Chinese environment. When we were growing up, I remember we were, you know, we would have two separate tables. And one table is all the mothers and one table is all the kids with all their, their mates. We call them armorers at the time. Mm -hmm. So, so, and then they would start patronizing the Hong Kong people. Like, you know, we Chinese started to buy jewelries, gemstones, and while, while all these Cantonese, they're wearing clocks, queuing up to buy gold, you know, that mm -hmm. patronizing mm -hmm. manner. Mm -hmm. So we were all very ashamed. We, we would bow our head and we would nod our head and we, we shake our head and say, oh my God, not again, not again. We have no perception about how China is and how, she, for me, I had no, no understanding and how Shanghai was, you know, until I saw some pictures on, about Shanghai on the West Point. I said, oh God, it looks like Westminster in England. No idea. So in 92, during the Easter holidays, she literally forced all of us to go to China. We have no, uh, no, how, no curiosity to go to China, to go to Europe is better than going back to China. Interesting. Okay. So this is the, the colonial attitude, mm -hmm. right? Went to China, she didn't get his house, she didn't find his, her house. We ended up buying a property and we we're going to build. And my mother, it's the first time she ever done, done business. And my whole, I didn't want to come back to Hong Kong. And, and my whole thing was finding excuse to stay in England as, as long as possible. But my father basically said to me when I told him, you know, if we, I told him if I want to come back, if I'm back, I have to open a gallery. My father said over his dead body. Really? Yeah, over he said, I didn't send my daughter away for over t t 10 years to come back to become a shopkeeper. She's, she, he had no idea about... Um, about what a gallery is, and he built up five public company, quoted company, and he believed that. How could the daughter be having such small dreams mm -hmm. instead of joining the family business, this, da, 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 and etc. But my take is that I didn't want to work with my family members, especially my half brothers, and too many political. So the next thing which he did is he cut off all my credit card, everything. And then he said to me, since I love to buy all these frivolous things, you know, paintings or sculptures, and I buy it with his credit card, and I ended up, all ended up uh, putting in his house, 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 I shipped back and back to Hong Kong and put it in, and in his house. And he said that, he said, if I want to continue with, with my decadent and extravagant life, I have to make my own money. And my only opportunity is to go to Shanghai and to learn to become a property developer. And then, if not, I will end up being a receptionist somewhere and wouldn't even pay for and for, for anything. So this is my only avenue in life if I want to continue with my expensive high living. 
So what choice did I have? I have to come back and come back to Hong Kong. And I have a very good deals with my father, actually, because my father said three weeks. I said, I couldn't even speak Mandarin. I, my Chinese then is until 11 years old. What do you expect me to do? He said, you can learn. So then my deal was three weeks Shanghai, two weeks Hong Kong, two weeks London. All expenses paid. Okay, that was my only, only agreement that I would go to, and to Shanghai. So when I went to Shanghai, no idea how to do property development, completely no idea, no idea about the Chinese culture, mm -hmm. no idea about anything, and he was supposed to have someone to come and teach me. And anyway, so um, at that time, Shanghai was very interesting because it just opened up. And every little road you turn around, you have surprises. You have surprises, all these shops and, and all What year things. was that? Um, I went there in 1993. Okay. Okay, so, but the problem is to stay for three weeks there without friends is pretty tough because you end up in the hotel most of the time. I go out, I, I, I heard people, and they were speaking men as Chinese, that they are trying to take advantage of me, they want to charge higher, but I couldn't converse because when I was growing up, I always hear my mother speaking and I tried to overheard how she would tell her friends about us, me and my brothers, mm. but we were never forced to converse. So I could understand, but I could not. Couldn't carry on I the mean, conversation. I mean, I wasn't deaf, but I was dumb. So you hear about mm. things and you cannot even negotiate. So anyway, so it goes on, and then my first month's salary, I bought a Chinese artist painting, whom I met here in Hong Kong. A my contemporary artist. Contemporary. Mm. My, my friend opened a gallery and forced all of us to buy a painting, and she thought that I could speak Chinese, so she put me right beside him. Little did she know that I could speak Chinese, I could write some basic say, uh, Chinese, but it was very lucky because after I met him, after our basic uh, handwritten conversation, so every time I was in Shanghai, I got my assistant to call him up. So he would be the one who brought me around the Chinese art. Oh, wow. Scene. So that was the beginning scene. of That it. was okay. the beginning. So I was going around the Chinese art scene. But luckily, I couldn't speak because I think I had this really arrogant a an attitude. Do you know this really British colonialism? Attitude. If I would have spoken, I w they would have dropped me. Like you would have cake. turned them off. Yeah, yeah. they yeah. completely dropped me. So after several months, I went out with them several times, many times actually. For the first time, I have you know I got my secretary in, so she would do the translation. So I start asking them. I said, "You guys are a little bit weird." And then he said, "Why?" And I said, "In England." We talk about politics, social system. We talk about street culture. I said, you guys are talking about Confucianism, Taoism, Buddhism. I said, this is, this is so passe. And you collect, when you have a little bit of money, they buy these antiquities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I said, why are you guys so weird? So you were really, you really ended up initiating much of the, what, if you can call yeah, it. Yeah, because they talk between themselves. Self. I mean, I couldn't put my word in, so I can only listen. You know, after the second time, I brought some of my, I mean, one staff in, and they write notes, and then ask them to do research. Remember, at the, you don't have Google to do research, right, right? right? So they have to go to library, and they would do the research, and they translate in English for me. So at the end, so I asked them, and they said that. They couldn't, they couldn't understand me. He said, really, Hong Kong people is like this? This? And he said, you're actually white, white, white. Because, he said, didn't you understand that there's a cultural revolution? A cultural revolution is anti-Confucianism. Did you realize that all over the world, Chinese, we still abide to, to Confucianism, Taoism? And I said, no. And he said, yes, your respect, your, your, your obligation, your compliances, this is all Confucius. And so and so, so much of that still remains though, does it? I not? mean even if you go to America, all the Chinese even if we don't know that I didn't know that that was Confucius, you know. I didn't yes. know about all that. But then it is and the Taoist V, of course we is. We still abide. 
So of course, when they say something, I ask them to write notes. We go back, we check the facts, we learn more. So every time, whenever they're conversational, because my Chinese standard is really, really low, I have no idea about Chinese culture. So little by little, I learn about. About different things, like in, I mean, in the nineties, we always talk about、um, the Western hierarchy of art forms: fine art over、um, design and over decorative art. Then I realized that Chinese literati is two、um, thousand years ago. They have no segregations of art, art, decorative art, and all design. It、they、was all everything.、Mm-hmm, they do、mm-hmm. music. They do art.、Mm-hmm. They do architecture. They do everything. Well, they, much like they, the Renaissance. I mean, in, yeah, in I, Bauhaus as well.、Mm-hmm. But、um, but there's no segregation at all. Everything was of about communication, about equal status. The next thing. You know, in the nineteen sixties, seventies in America, we we talk about neo conceptualism using text as art. Okay. Yes, I remember. We start from very beginning. Art form is calligraphy,、cool. but but it's not just calligraphy. But people write poetry, and but that time the proper poetry is the is the form of the language. Of course, now when we look back, they are all in classical Chinese. But these are like today you write. You write text, so so as oh my God! I thought the West is cool, but actually China is so cool. We start all that the text, 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 text as art, starting thousands of years ago. I remember seeing at the Metropolitan Museum a special exhibit of、um, calligraphy that Jerry Wang owns. I don't know if you've seen that, but it was no. But Jer- Jerry Ann is, is is one of the biggest calligraphy, but it's not calligraphy by itself. No, it's but the, it's, I mean,、mm-hmm. I mean, it's not the art form, but it's conceptual art because it's about text. But the text is in poetry form. So I decided, well, okay. When I first went there, I could, I call myself Hong Kongese. After ten years during the French year in China, I call myself Chinese because I really learned to become a Chinese, to be proud of a Chinese culture, which was completely lost in me. So then, though, the irony is that you became the epitome of contemporary art,、mm. Chinese contemporary art. So, because Chinese contemporary art, I think another thing between West and And Chinese. So when we talk about the Western contemporary art, we always look at modernism. Modernism is the root of the of the contemporary art, meaning that you cut traditions. There's no more traditions. There's no more history. You have to cut everything,、mm. and you build something new. Is that modernist architecture? But in China, it's very different. China is very big, as we all know. There is different threads of art. There is a Big community and the big big art form is evolving from traditions. So even Western academics or Western person not knowing about Chinese history, because in the, also in the Western contemporary art we are saying that you don't need to read history, you just look at the piece of art, you have that communication and then you will appreciate. It won't work with Chinese art because, especially if they evolve from traditions. And in Chinese, how can any Chinese cut cut away the five thousand years of、so、you history? You need those layers of understanding. It's all that layers. I mean, I'm gradually learning more because a lot of artists actually they they're inspired by the by the poetry, the Chinese poetry. But all but all the most of the Chinese.、Uh, Um, old painting, traditional in ancient time, is all about poetry. So, Pearl, looking at what's happening today, especially with this slowdown a bit in the Chinese economy,、mm. um, uh, nonetheless a very active and vibrant economy, but nonetheless but a, slowdown. a slowdown. Big slowdown. How has that impacted your business since you are dealing with? Actually, in art, you don't, because a lot of people is transferring their and their asset value. Into art, especially if we talk about the economy as such, is a lot of Chinese is not just buying Chinese art; they buy international artists, because Chinese、mm-hmm. art, the most expensive. My analysis is that the most expensive art in the whole world is contemporary art. Modern contemporary art is America, UK as well, and China. China is very high the prices. 
and there are a lot of Chinese artists, a lot of Chinese art artworks who are very high. It's only collected by Chinese in China or Chinese in Asia or Chinese around the world. Okay. And when you see the RMB, especially the RMB is depreciating, then many of the people are putting money in international art, art like uh, impressionist, modern art, or post-war. Interesting. Yeah. So, so in a way, um, beside the Chinese art, of course. Yeah. Because international art, they believe. I mean, it's they are taking it as an investment value. Because if you take it as an investment value, you want to buy a piece of art that has international support. So th this view that some people have that China's brightest and wealthiest are actually leaving China for the West because they're trying to um, protect their asset base. Is that, is that really the case? Or no, is that... I, I can't say that, okay, because they know that at the end, when they know how to do business, make money, you still have to remain in China. They are transferring asset outside China, yes. But whether they are actually leaving... Whether they're leaving. Leave, no, mm -hmm. their children are abroad, yes. The children are abroad is also for better education and also to build a, a build an international network. I think you know when you look at every country. I mean, today is globalization. You can't just do to be in China. You know, you look at Chinese company. Chinese company are buying all these international companies because you have to be international. And also, what China is lacking is management. So they are all going abroad and trying to learn about different management. And coming back. And coming back. And obviously, they are investing all over the world, right? And, of, and obviously, they are also taking money out of China, putting somewhere else as well. well. Let's talk about the millennials in China, mm. because I'm sure you know yes. them pretty well. Tell me, since many of them, I would say most of them, were since the time they were born, there's been nothing but the millennials, I tell you, the problem I find for the millennials, especially from the one-child policy, they're very spoiled. Very, very spoiled. So the little I don't emperor. Know, I really don't know how this generation is going to be like. Because high consumption, um, we look at those who are in the 50s, uh, 50s or even late 40s, they are very careful with their money. There's a lot of saving. Um, any age beyond that, I mean, below that, they spend. They spend like there's no tomorrow, okay? So Especially, their consumption has continued, though there's been less Oh, yes, there. because uh -huh. their one-child policy, the both side grandparents and the parents just give their money to spend. But, with, I mean, materialistic. Mm -hmm. I mean, materials and materialistic luxury becomes very important to show their status. So that is going on and on that way. Whether they can... They understand the values or contribute. I don't know. They're not as hungry as as the older generation. That's interesting. In general, mm -hmm. I'm not talking about some of those whom I met who are studying abroad. Some of those are brilliant. Those I I met abroad. So depending on depending on the family structure, depending on how. But I also met a lot of students from abroad brought who may be in the best university, they couldn't speak a word of English. And after being there for like 10, 11 years, because they only mix with Chinese. And they're very good in engineering, you know, all those calculations. Mm -hmm. they, they, mm -hmm. they, have, they have no social skills with anybody outside the Chinese. So if you had to, if, if you had to give a prognosis, since this is a, such an important time, I think, just globally, is are you optimistic about China's future? And if so, what is the basis for your optimism? It's very hard to say because China is so big. Who, what I've seen is, I've, I've only seen in the cities, the first line of cities, uh, staff and also the staff who works for me. How I see mm -hmm. their working aptitude and attitude. Um, I've seen how some, you know, they're not as hungry as and as the older one. At the same time, I'm seeing some of the elite's children abroad, 
who study very hard and some of them is not, not as young. Mm-hmm. So it's hard to say, especially China is so big. But one child policy, obviously, they got spoiled. I mean, I have uh, staff in my, in my galleries um, who may be really good in writing essays or doing several things, but they cannot do practical things. They cannot, you know, when I was sent abroad, I know how to change a fuse in a, in a socket or whatever. They can't do anything of this. They could. They just could not. All these small things, mm-hmm. they that just could not do it. your way if you can't do the basics. No, they cannot. Mm. They may be very good students, huh? But all these little things, because it's never done by them. It's one child policy. Remember, you have one child, so you are spoiled. You know, your parents gives you everything. Your two, two side grandparents gives you ev- and everything. They save up and give everything to the child. So that sounds like a challenge for China's continued growth and success. What are the reasons that it should be successful? Is, is there a way to correct that or are there other... I think, I think when you look at the consumption market, okay, China will be the biggest consumption market. Mm-hmm. That is neatness to say. And they are spending. Mm-hmm. I mean, if... Any big companies abroad, they're all investing in, in, in China because of the consumption power. China, if China is clever, I mean, I think China is, has been very clever. The investment that they put abroad in, uh, in Africa, in South America to get resources Australia. because mm-hmm. China doesn't have the resources. And now to put money in agricultural product, they are actually backing all the whole system up. And these are what? Is missing. I think though those moves are extremely clever. The only problem of the next three years is there are more old people than and then mm-hmm. young people. So we have to look at the medical care and which pension. is a problem. And yeah. medical care is a big problem, and pension is a big problem. And also in the Chinese culture, we don't do old people's home. So how can a millennial to look after six old people? Mm-hmm. So all these are going to be a big burden. And, and whether their investment abroad, the Chinese government investment abroad, can support this medical, uh, the medical care and also uh, the pensions. So all these are the critical points. And what about the environment? The environment, I think they are trying to do things about it, but I was told by, by my friends in California as well, they told me in California in the 70s, in the 80s, it's all black sky. If, if the government are determined to deal with it, they will. But the government, I think the difficulties is China is still an industrial country. Okay, and, and I don't know how they are going to use clean energy to support this industrial. It's like in China now is an industrial revolution. Okay, and at the time in England, and you know, England during the Industrial Revolution is all black sky. It's a black sky, and it's so cities. But yeah. it's just that in China today, we realize there is this environmental problems, and we don't want to have this environmental problems to spread because it's killing people. So I don't know how China is is dealing with it because unfortunately, it didn't happen a hundred years ago. When, when. And when there were, there's no world attention in envir- environmental protection. And this pollution is getting very bad. And well, people are so aware of it. It does nowadays. seem as if it's got the attention of the Chinese populace. And they are they Of are course, because I think Chinese government is also doesn't want to upset the general public. Because the last thing that they want is a revolution. That's what they call the harmony. Yes, right? exactly. Mm-hmm. So they will sort it out. How is very difficult. You want to have growth. The growth is depending on, on industry, you know, factories, manufacturing and all that. At the same time, we don't want to have so much pollution because it's hurting people's health. It's tough. It's yeah. really a tough job. Is there anything that we haven't brought up that you think is important to think about in terms of this, especially China and the West? I think, I think one of the issues is people are very scared of, of China growth. Fear. People and, in the rest of the world. In the rest, rest of the world. Because whenever I go, people is actually having that fear of China being too powerful, especially when China 
um, is spending on military. But then when you look at America, America military expenses are far higher than and then China. What do you think that, what, what is the answer to this fear of Chinese? Because I hear this too. A continuous, really I me. think the concern is, I think it needs to have a better communication. I mean, obviously Chinese is getting bigger and bigger. The economy is getting bigger and bigger. Um, there's a fear and there is a dependent. So, so how is the Chinese government, this is about the, sophistic, uh, the sophistication of the Chinese government, going out, being to manage a situation being humble. I think, you know, I think Chinese, the problem is the Chinese government has lost what originally Chinese we have is, is to be humble to deal with. The stronger China is, the more humble China should be and less intimidating. Because that's a very I, interesting. That's I a think very this is thing. this is what the old Chinese would have done. Well, but, and I, I think that you know that's really my purpose in doing these conversations because I I, I think that for. But I also see that China has been suppressed by the West for 150 years, nearly 200 years. So now they have gained their strength. They want the world to know about the strength, not being pushed down, not being suppressed. But I hope that China would re remember how, you know, the stronger that you get, the humble that you get, and you get way more, um, much more knowledge than going out, being, showing people your feelings. Well, frankly, I think uh, the West could take a few lessons there as well. I mean, the West is also... Is arrogance of uh, arrogance, mm -hmm. and also the West want China to go down. Wants it. it won't happen. It won't. It's like a hundred years ago, or sixty, seventy years ago, British disappeared, and American America comes into power. Same thing about China now. I think we all have to accept that China is is coming into power. It's coming to be the lead. Instead of being fearful, I think this collaborative work has to be done. I think it is the collaborative century, if we if we are smart. I mean, the global the world. world is asking for collaboration. Yeah. It's not to be aggressive. Pearl, this is great. I think this is a great place to stop because I know you have other things to do. I really yeah. want to thank you for sharing your perspectives. It's been it's been terrific. Thank you for thank joining you. us. Thank you.